All right, so um, welcome this welcome everyone to this week's edition of Paleo Perks. Um, this week, uh, my name is Elizabeth Seibert. I'm one of the um, committee who makes this happen week after week. And this week, it is my great pleasure to introduce Sarah Sheffield, who will be giving a talk titled Untangling the Broad Scale Evolutionary Patterns of Paleozoic Echinoderms. So for those of you who have not yet been to a Paleo Perks seminar or haven't been for a little while, just a quick note about the format of today's seminar. We'll spend the next two or so minutes going over some welcome and announcements. Sarah will then give her talk and we'll follow that up with a moderated Q&A. Um, and then Sarah unfortunately has to teach right after this, so she won't be able to stick around for tea time, but there's plenty of time for really good Q&A time. So definitely make sure to ask your questions then. Um, for those of you who are um, not necessarily familiar with the Paleo Perks format, we strongly recommend sending in your questions via the chat to the questions at Paleo Perks host, and that is Raymond today. And we will also be able to let you raise hand and unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question verbally at the end. Um, any technical issues can also go to the questions host. So, just a couple of little housekeeping things before we get going. Um, the first is that Paleo Parks really values the participation of all folks interested in the paleo sciences. And so you should not have been able to get in here without necessarily signing up to abide by our code of conduct. But if you have managed to do so, please take a moment to pop over to our website and make sure that you are aware of the code of conduct that you have agreed to by participating in today's seminar. Um, we also ask that you leave yourselves muted for the duration of the talk. And as a reminder, you can ask questions by chatting to the Paleo Perks host, and that again is Raymond today, or by using the raise hand function at the end of the talk, and we'll let you unmute. Um, a couple of little, little announcements as well. We um, have a closed captions built into Zoom, so you can see that I have captions running on this Google um, presentation, but we can also toggle captions by hitting the CC button on and off Zoom, so you can turn them on and off for yourselves. And we also would like to encourage you to nominate any outstanding early career researchers to join our potential speaker pool. Um, and so we will leave a link for that in the chat. We also have a weekly demographic survey that we encourage you to fill out. Just let us know how we're doing, who's coming to these seminars, so that we can do a better job of ensuring that you are getting exciting things out of what we're doing here. Um, so we have also dropped that in the chat and that is anonymous and encouraged. All right, so that's the housekeeping. Um, so today's speaker is Dr. Sarah Sheffield and Sarah got her bachelor's from the University of North Carolina and master's from the university or from Auburn University before going on to do of Tennessee, Knoxville. Um, she then became a visiting instructor at the University of South Florida and is now an assistant professor there. And her work as centers on echinoderm paleobiology, but also some really incredible science communication work as well. So um, with that, I would like to invite Sarah to take over the screen share and we'll hear your talk. Thank you so much for first the invitation and for having me here and the introduction. I'm really excited to be here one moment while I have done Zoom multiple times somehow. Okay, there we go. I have no idea what just happened. Okay, can everybody see my screen? It looks great. Perfect, all right, great, thank you so much. All right, so as Elizabeth said, I'm gonna be talking to you a little bit about the broad scale evolutionary patterns of paleozoic echinoderms. So this is gonna kind of walk you through a couple of my more recent articles and uh, future paths for research. But first we're gonna be inferring phylogeny, uh, phylogenetic hypotheses for different groups of paleozoic echinoderms. And then we're gonna use those hypotheses to start to uncover uh, evolutionary patterns like biogeography and changes in morphology through time across major events in Earth's history. So just in case uh, echinodermata is not at the forefront of your brain, I assume it is, of course, but these are the organisms that are defined by a five-ishness, a high magnesium calcite skeleton, and a water vascular system that helps them with a number of uh, important life functions. And these are the five extant groups today. The extant diversity is incredible, but it's quite limited compared to the fossil record. So if we take a step back all the way from the Cambrian into the Devonian, 
the image of an echinoderm gets much broader. This is a phylogenetic hypothesis, one of many, of echinoderm diversity. And we can see here, uh, there's so much diversity here from uh, echinoderms that really look more like soft, soft serve ice cream cones to things that really don't look anything like what we thought echinoderms did. So I'm gonna, we're gonna be focusing today on the Paleozoic echinoderms. Now, along with their high diversity, we also see extremely high disparity, almost unrivaled in the invertebrate world. This is a uh, work done by Brad DeLine in 2015. This is a principal coordinates analysis. So the further the dots are away from one another, the more different they are essentially. So we can see that echinoderms really fill out the board here on different body plans through time. So one of the questions here is why? Why are they evolving this high disparity? Why the high diversity? Why do they show all these incredible uh, different morphological features? Well, one hypothesis is they're responding to climate change. Echinoderms today are very sensitive to changes in ocean temperature, salinity, et cetera. There's no reason to think they were different in the past. So here is a carbon isotope uh, curve for the Ordovician. And we can see that climate during the Ordovician, which is where most of our talk is gonna focus today, is not that stable. We have highs, we have lows, we have major events like the Great Ordovician Biodiversification event leading into the late Ordovician mass extinction, which was caused by a gigantic glaciation. So that's a possibility. So maybe we could start to use some of this information we have to possibly tease out things like biogeographic patterns. Here is a biogeographic pattern uh, proposed by Lefebvre et al, where we can see that echinoderm diversity changes biogeographically among these four time slices of the Ordovician. We see in 470 million years ago, echinoderms are crowding down towards the poles. And this is about the time where the earth is starting to get a little bit warmer. So it makes sense. They might've uh, you know, packed their bags and run down to the South Pole to stay a little bit cooler. Obviously kidding, not how that works, but uh, so we can see some possible ideas through there. However, we're missing uh, the first step here, and that is most of our traditional groups of echinoderms are not monophyletic, which means they're not natural evolutionary groups, so we can't even begin to start answering some of these questions. So they're not monophyletic. What does that mean? It's easier to explain this in terms of the other types of groups, paraphyletic and polyphyletic. So paraphyletic means we're missing some of the descendants. So a great example of this is fish. Humans come from fish. Technically, we are fish. You can walk in, greet your students, and say, hello, fish, and no one will find you funny. I've tried it for many semesters, and it still doesn't work, and I will still continue trying. Or, on the other hand, we have polyphyletic. That means taking multiple descendants and shoving them into a single group. So a great example of this is the pachyderms. So things like elephants and the other large uh, scaly-skinned vertebrates that we have. So makes sense. They look fairly similar, they're big, they're gray, they're kind of weird looking, but it turns out they're actually kind of big, gray, weird looking for very different reasons evolutionarily. So we can't put them into a single group. Evolution tells us they belong to multiple groups. So for evolutionary analyses, we have to have these monophyletic groupings before we can start to answer any questions about biogeography or any other evolutionary trends. So that's what we're gonna do. So to do this, we're gonna look at homology. Homology is the concept of uh, characteristics that are passed down from a common ancestor. Uh, here's a great example. Um, so if you would pick up your arm, please. We have a demonstration here. So everybody has, all tetrapods have the same basic breakdown here. A humerus, one bone, a radius and ulna, two bones, and then many bones, your wrist and finger bones. So the humerus here is labeled because uh, it's in red. So I wanted to make sure that was noticeable. So uh, everybody's got that one bone, two bone, many bone that's descended from some of our first ancestors that walked on land. That is a homologous trait. We can use that to find similarities between organisms to construct our evolutionary hypotheses. That's in opposition to homoplasy, where characteristics that look similar, we evolve through time, but it's not due to evolutionary uh, evolution. Uh, bleh, evolution, there we go. So great example here, Birds and pterosaurs, they both have wings, but they don't have wings because of a common ancestor. Wings have re-evolved through time. As I said here, this parrot is not to scale or that would be terrifying, right? This is the more correct tree. There is the presence of wings shows up more than once. Birds and T-Rex are linked by number of traits. Of course, dinosaurs are, or birds are dinosaurs. So we're gonna use these ideas, we're using more common examples now, and let's move them to echinoderms. So obviously these are not as easy.
but bear with me. Using this, we can start to understand echinoderm homologies and build these evolutionary uh, hypotheses. So you don't need to know anything about these, but what you can see is that the oral plates, which I'm highlighting here with my mouse, also in red, there, they are the same homologous structure, but they've been incorporated into the body differently. Just like we saw with the humerus radius ulna, they might look a little different, but we can still trace that common ancestry. So today we're gonna to be zooming in on this portion of the tree to blastozoa. So these are echinoderms with brachial plates for feeding and specialized respiratory structures. We're really only gonna be looking at the respiratory structures today. But these groups of blastozoans have been delineated by respiratory structures. So one group has one kind, one group has another. However, morphology is extremely disparate and homoplasy, just like bird and bat wing, or bird and pterosaur wings, is likely. Here's an example of some of these respiratory structures that are external. You can see these little dots. Those are the respiratory structures. Here are some where they are internal. This is a blastoid, probably one of the more familiar groups of blastozoan echinoderms. Gas exchange is happening on the inside here through these holes. So diploporins, one of my favorite groups to work with because there's so many questions that we can still ask. Diploporins or diploporitons are defined by a diplopore respiratory structure, which simply means double pore. So there's two pores in each set of respiratory structures. This is Haploceronus, a beautiful fossil. If we zoom right in here, you can see those two little dots. This is where gas exchange is gonna be taking place. There's gonna be a thin uh, membrane layer across it, allowing for gas exchange between the seawater and uh, the body itself. All diploborans have this structure. Some look a little different, some have little canals connecting them. This is polycystis, this melted golf ball looking thing, right? We see these little canals here linking the two pores. So it's their diplopore respiratory structure called hematopores. We'll bring that up later. And I lied, some diploporins don't actually have diplopores at all. This is amphorocystis. We have no idea, still a question. And then we have some completely different organisms that have diplopores as well. This is an edrio asteroid, which if you're envisioning with me, and in a cookie, because who doesn't love cookies, with a starfish slapped on top of it, and it has respiratory structures. So either I have told you a lie, spun you a yarn, and none of this is making sense, or we don't have monophyletic groupings here, right? So let's take a look at this in a little bit more in depth. Not only does diploporita not have uh, what we would consider a feature that's consistent across its groupings, we also see massive amounts of disparity in other structures of the body. So here are three examples here, uh, lovely ones, gonfocystitis, polycystis, and amorphocystis. And all of them have extremely disparate features with how they're attaching to the sea floor, their mouth structures, their arm structures, et cetera. So maybe diploprida isn't monophyletic. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the homologous features of uh, these echinoderms. We're going to infer a phylogenetic tree, and then we're gonna test for the uh, monophyly of diploprida. We're not gonna spend a ton of time on this because we're just setting the stage for the next step of this. But here is diploporita, a polyphyletic assemblage. So just like uh, our friends, the pachyderms, this is not one evolutionary group. We have thrown a bunch of different groups together on the basis of a feature, in this case, diplopore respiratory structures. So this means that respiratory structures are homoplastic. I've color coded this and provided a shape code for you so we can track it a little bit more easily. We can see that there's one monophyletic group here highlighted in red or the circle. We can see that the yellow and the triangle appears multiple times throughout the tree. We see the greens here showing up at different places and we have a blue one all the way here showing up also with a square there. So it is polyphyletic. So now that we know this, we can start to use this phylogenetic hypothesis to understand more broad evolutionary questions. So we're gonna to ask today, how did diploporins evolve across the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event, the Gobi, and the Late Ordovician Mass Extinction, the Loam? And I'm gonna go by Gobi and Loam because otherwise I'm gonna get super tongue-tied here in about two minutes. So the Gobi here was a three and four-fold increase in family and genus level diversity. This seems to track across multiple different groups of fossils and especially echinoderms. So most of our information from this time about echinoderms really comes from crinoids. So here is some really great work done by Selena Cole and Bertrand Lefebvre. And we see that crinoids also experience this large increase in family and genus level diversity during this time. 
The abiotic drivers for the Gobi are not fully understood. It's likely a mix of things, but some of the ideas that have come about and some of the amazing research um, coming from this particular area has been things like increasing atmospheric oxygen, decreasing global temperatures, or increased weathering possibly through uh, things like the taconic or the taconic orogeny, maybe delivering extra nutrients to the marine realm. There's all kinds of things that could be happening here. Now, there's very few studies of diploporin diversity in biogeography, and we can really expand that statement to say most of blastozoans are really not well studied about this time. Here's one example of Elise Nardin and Bertrand Lefebvre showing some diversification increases during the Middle Ordovician, which would be where the Gobi was happening. But as we said, these studies were, or as we said, this is the first phylogenetic hypothesis of diploporida that we've really seen. So these studies here have treated diploporida as monophyletic. This is due to a lack of available phylogenetic studies. Both of these provided excellent ideas and context to build on. But now that we know that diploporida is not monophyletic, we need to go back and look at some of these again. So we're going to use this phylogenetic hypothesis. The tree is going to look a little bit different here in a minute because we're going to be time stratifying it, but it will be the same information here. So this is the same tree you looked at. It is polyphyletic. So what we did is we investigated the paleobiogeography of diploporins within a phylogenetic context and looked at the speciation types. We used the R package, geo, uh, biogeobears, to reconstruct the ancestral ranges within the phylogenetic basins. So there's eight defined basins. These were identified first in Lamb et al., Adrian Lamb et al., 2018. And these are defined by thermal and physical barriers. We've got Gondwana, Baltica, Russia, and a host of them in Laurentia. And this is our same tree that we've been looking at with all the colors and shapes. It's now just been time uh, calibrated uh, against the geologic time scale here. And these species ranges came from the Pale paleobiology database, as well as from published literature sources. We used the tree that we saw to uh, Bayesian tip date. And so that is how we are getting this tree here. To use BioGeo bears, it incorporates three biogeographic base models. Each of them has a plus J parameter, meaning it allows for uh, jump dispersal to be added on in part of the model. Jump dispersal means uh, dispersing over long distances, like in an ocean basin or something. We don't need to know too much about these different models here, but if you're interested in biogeography, this is a great uh, slide for you to refer to. So what we find, in hours, when we ran the data, the diva like so the diver, uh, dispersal vicariance likelihood model plus jump parameter fit our model or fit our data the best. In fact, every single one of the models with the plus J parameter fit our models better than without it. And that's a pretty good indication that jump dispersal, again, dispersing over long distances was a really important way that echinoderm, uh, echinoderms in this analysis were dispersing. So, here we've got our tree. We have our most likely basins that they're originating from here. And we have vicariance and dispersal, vicariance and dispersal highlighted by the triangles and the circles. So the circles are vicariance. And you can pretty clearly see that dispersal is dominant here by a large amount. There's really only a couple few uh, vicariance events. So dispersal is really dominant in this particular uh, scenario. And that makes sense. So if we take a look at some of the surface ocean surface ocean circulation models from the Ordovician, there's a number of gyres that uh, these little blastozoans could have used to disperse these long distances. So all echinoderms have a swimming, free swimming larval stage, uh, even things like starfish and things like that today, they all have a free swimming larval stage. So these organisms in their larval stages were dispersing longer distances. The next step that we took was to determine the number, percentage, and direction of the dispersal events, which are dominant in our models. Again, dispersal was extremely dominant. And this can be done through something called biostochastic mapping. So here is a completely unrelated example to ours today, uh, published by Dupin et al. in 2017. And so what we see here is we have the uh, ancestral basin to the descendant basin here. And the higher number means the higher number of events of dispersing. And the warmer color also gives an indication that there's a higher number. So we can see here that from South America to, uh, excuse me, words are just not coming today sometimes. From South America to Central America, we see an extremely high number of dispersal events. We can see a, maybe a more easy to understand graphical interpretation of this below where the 
dispersal. So we can see here from South America to Central America, there's a lot of dispersal by that very thick line and less so into other basins. So we're gonna use this to help visualize the number of dispersal events that were occurring throughout our uh, time of study. So we time sliced the biostochastic bio -stochastic mapping uh, into three different pieces. And again, I would like to say this was done by myself, Adrian Lamb and Nicholas Matsky, um, published recently in 2021, I believe. So this, uh, we time sliced it into three pieces, the early, the middle, and the late Ordovician. And this is the first study to take a time sliced BSM approach. So here is some of those results. Time slice one, the tremidocene to Dipingian stages of the Ordovician. We see a lot of dispersal events, especially from Gondwana to Laurentia and back. And we see a lot from Baltica to Southern Laurentia and Western Mekana to the Southern Appalachian Basin. As we move into the middle Ordovician, which is the Gobi, we see less dispersal overall, but we do still see plenty of activity going on. Less so from these longer, di longer distance bases, but lots of dispersal still happening. And then we move into the later Ordovician, and we see a lot more dispersal happening across these basins, like from Laurentia to Gondwana and back. So we're definitely seeing different levels of dispersal throughout these three intervals. So can we tie this to anything going on with uh, the Gobi? So maybe abiotic drivers. So we've got a number of uh, variables here, atmospheric oxygen, oxygen 18, carbon 13, global sea levels. Can we tie any of these drivers to possible speciation uh, events in blastozoans? So if you're looking at this going, gee, I don't see anything. Astute, not much to see. Unfortunately, our blastozoan speciation spread out fairly evenly throughout this time. So it's really difficult to pin any specific abiotic driver to it at this point. However, this is one of the first studies that's been done on these particular blastozoan groups within a phylogenetic context. Jennifer Bauer just recently published uh, an article on blastoid biogeography as well. So once we start to build more of these databases, it will likely become more clear what might be happening or in what areas do we have higher speciations. So as I said, speciation rates at this time are kind of difficult to tie to specific abiotic drivers. So as we move away from the Great Ordovician biodiversification event, let's move into the late Ordovician mass extinction, the loam, and into the Silurian. So the loam, uh, the late Ordovician mass extinction saw a mass glaciation, sea levels dropping, a mass recession, and the kind of germ dynamics across this time are not incredibly well understood, and most of that comes from crinoids. I've added some crinoids here because I thought it was just too long since we'd seen a fossil, and why else are we here? So here's some beautiful crinoids. So most of our data really comes from crinoids and not from other stem echinoderms at this time. So again, I'm sorry, you're probably sick of seeing this graph, but diploprida is polyphyletic. So now that we have this uh, phylogenetic hypothesis here, we're gonna start to take a look at a particular group here. So as I said, there was one group that did represent a monophyletic, and that is right here, highlighted by this circle, the spheronidids, which are some absolutely beautiful specimens. So within spheronidids, there's two groups that appear. There's two uh, groups within it. And the first is primarily dominated by Ordovician Baltic taxa. So most of the Ordovician representatives are in Baltica. So they're uh, these lovely creatures right here. And they're identified with ambulacra, these five-ishness grooves here that branch, you can see these little branches here on Eucystis, and each of those branches end in a little brachial facet, a single facet. The other group of spheronidids is primarily Silurian, and they're primarily in Laurentia. Uh, these ambulacra do not branch. You can see here the ambulacral grooves are itty bitty. So if you see that little five-ish shape, those little itty bitty grooves there, that's what's going on. They have extremely short branches and they have hematophores. These are highly unusual looking compared to other blastozoans. Uh, these have been the study of much of uh, paleontology and echinoderms of the Silurian of North America because of how weird looking they are. They've got a whole bunch of weird features. For one, they're gigantic compared to other diploporans. Um, very large, the biggest one is actually about the size of my hand. Most of them are quite small. So there's some weird questions about what's going on. Another strange thing that happens is that they reached unusually high abundance in Laurentia following the Ordovician extinction. Usually diploporans are an extremely rare gift from the earth. You don't find that many of them. But for some reason in the Silurian and the mid-continent of the United States, so like Indiana, Ohio, Tennessee, places like that, they are in 
thousands. It's quite unusual. So question, how has the disparity of this group changed across evolutionary time, biogeographic distance, and across the late Ordovician mass extinction? So this work is going to be published sometime this week. Um, it is work that I've done with uh, Dr. Adrian Lamb and Dr. Brad Deline. So again, this work is going to kind of build on what we just learned about biogeography during the late or, or during the Gobi and the loam. We use the time stratified trees and basins from LAM et al. 2020. Since we're not changing any of the phylogenetic data here, we remove the non-spheronated taxa, and we're just going to be looking at the biogeographic patterns of the, of the spheronidids from here on out. So all I did here, or all we did here, was cut this out to just include the spheronidids themselves. So from the middle to late Ordovician, here are the remaining dispersal events that occurred in just that small group. So most of our, uh, most of our dispersal is coming from Baltica to Laurentia. There is some from Cincinnati Basin to the Southern Laurentian Basin. And that's actually represented by a really cool recent fossil find here, uh, Holocystites, which is this creature right here on top. This is Holocystites scatellus. Uh, ancestors of Holocystites dispersed from Cincinnati Basin to the Southern Laurentia Basin in modern day Quebec, Anacostia Island, and a population of Holocystites rose there. In this lovely example here, Holocystites salmoensis, and that's published in Sheffield et al. 2018. So during the Silurian is where things get a little interesting. There's no inter uh, continental dispersal, so within Laurentia itself. So things get really quiet during the Silurian. The only real stuff that we see is dispersal from the Cincinnati Basin to the Appalachian Basin. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at what we learned about the biogeography, what we learned about the phylogeny, and we're gonna plot this all in the, in the context of phylogeny against the morphological changes. So we constructed characters of direct measurements of all of these ferronid specimens as well as use the phylogenetic characters published in Sheffield in summer all 2019, uh, the phylogenetic tree study. So we use multi-state and binary characters mixed in with these direct measurements to create this morphospace. So these morphospaces are gonna be grouped by taxonomic groupings and individual specimens. So as you can see here on the A and C on the left portion of this graph, there's only one dot per uh, taxon. On B and D on the right side, you can see multiple dots per taxon, that's by specimen. So we use multiple specimens if they were available. So just to make sure taphonomic signatures weren't uh, kind of driving any part of our analysis, we were quite careful to remove characters that were missing too much data. So we set two different limits. So we mod use modified data, which was worth 30%. If more than 30% of the data was missing, we remove, uh, we remove that data in, or remove those characters, excuse me. And then we did a second one where we called that data. If it was missing over 10%, we removed that data. So here are some of the taponomic issues that can happen. Um, so here we, on the right side of this, we have two beautifully preserved uh, angles here. This is polycystis and uh, really high quality preservation. However, it's more likely we're gonna get something like on the left here. This is holocystites. It should have the same types of plates and things like that, but as you can see, it's not really that well preserved. In this particular case, it's been dolomized, so a lot of that detail has kind of been uh, just taken away from us. So here are the phylomorphospace graphs. To introduce you again, A and C is going to be by taxon. B and D is going to be by individual specimens. A and B up here represent the modified characters, so over 30% missing. And then C and D in the bottom represent 10% missing. So that's how we're going to break this down. The green is the Laurentian taxa, the pink is the Baltic taxa. So what we can see before I put these arrows up and add more to this is that there's a distinct difference between the Baltic taxa and the Laurentian taxa. And there's statistics to back this up to show that they are quite different from one another, which makes sense because as I said, the Holocystites fauna look wildly different from any other group that we really see in Diploporita. So we can actually see this showing up in the Phylomorpho space they're quite distinct from one another. Now, between the cold and the modified data set, we really only see some changes. I'm gonna highlight those right here. So we'll see with Eucystis, you see Eucystis changes its position just a little bit. All right, and we see Polycystis and Pentacystis switching here. It's actually kind of an interesting situation. Both of these uh, instances have to do with the A ambulacrum. And what that is, is that food group that's positioned on top. So if you imagine a 
you have the A ambulacrum and I'm going to become the starfish here. My arm's gonna be the B, my leg's gonna be the C, my other leg's gonna be the D, and my other arm's gonna be the E. I know you can't see that. This was maybe the worst interpretive dance I've ever done, but there you go. Uh, so the A ambulacrum in both of these has been reduced. That's usually something that's uh, heterochronically driven. So it's usually where it's preserved those juvenile features where the A ambulacrum just doesn't appear. So both of those are being driven by that. So the, no, there's no major change. What's really interesting here is that there's no major change in morphospace in the Laurentian taxa. So while they're pretty distinct from the Baltic taxa, once they move into Laurentia, they don't actually spread out that much. They stay morphologically very similar. What's also interesting is that the body size is about twice as large as the Baltic taxa. And there's statistical evidence to show that this is significant. Um, and again, this paper will be out uh, sometime this week. So what's interesting here is that larger biogeographic distances appear to correlate with larger shifts in morphology. And we can see that. So for example, if we look at B and D, I'm gonna move my faces real quick, there we go. All right, with B and D, uh, holosis studies had very short uh, there were a number of different dispersal events to different basins, but they were all fairly limited to um, close to one another in Laurentia. It shows different, uh, very short morphological changes there. Polycystitis samoensis traveled a further distance, and it's more morphologically distinct. We see that too from Baltica and Laurentia. So this is just a pattern that we noticed. I'm not saying that this is a hard and fast rule by any means. We'll discuss that more in just a moment. So now the question why so little morphological change? Usually when organisms move into a new area, we see some new innovations and things like that. So this is rather unexpected. We really expected to see that these organisms here were more morphologically distinct from one another. Again, they're distinct from the Baltic taxa, but not really from one another. All of these kind of stay fairly similar. So why? after the establishment of these new communities. And as a reminder, these are Silurians. So these are coming in after the late Ordovician mass extinction. So it could be developmental constraints. Uh, there's been work to show that echinoderms really don't develop a whole bunch of new uh, uh, higher order uh, morphological uh, characteristics. They are somewhat restricted in their genomic development. That could be it. It's also interesting to note that they may have been filling a narrow niche vacated during the late Ordovician mass extinction. Many of the crinoids that vacated their niches during the loam had similar body types, like large arms close to the surface of the seafloor and things like that. So it's also possible that these organisms may have filled that narrow niche uh, that was vacated during the loam. Further study is going to be necessary here. All right, to summarize this talk here, phylogenetic frameworks are necessary to start to, to begin to test hypotheses of evolutionary patterns. So without these phylogenetic frameworks, we really can't start to make any uh, estimations of what might've been going on uh, with how they were responding to climate change, biogeography, anything like that. The levels of dispersal vary across the Ordovician and Silurian uh, and jump dispersal is particular echinoderms, which we also see in other studies uh, like Lamb et al. 2018 that show brachiopods and trilobites are primarily using uh, dispersal and jump dispersal at that. And with Bauer 2021, that showed that blastoids were using a lot of jump dispersal as well. The lack of Silurian intercontinental dispersal, so outside of Laurentia to anywhere else, could be due to limited geographic barriers like the Taconic orogeny preventing a lot of that, or it could have been due to changing sea level fluctuations that might have caused further isolation to these different basins. This is something that's also been seen in other studies, but it would take more work to uh, better understand these patterns. And finally, there's no expansive shifts in morphology after these new communities are developed in Laurentia. So once they're developed there, they really don't change morphologically a whole bunch. Uh, disparity really does appear to correlate with geographic distance, meaning higher disparity correlates with higher geographic distance. Uh, this is still something that we would like to explore a lot further. That's an idea that's still quite, my, quite in its infancy, but it's an interesting idea to look at. Laurentian taxa also trend much towards much larger body sizes, which anecdotally seems to be holding true across other groups of echinoderms as well. I know Ron Bifrens also do this, as well as some other groups as well. So further studies needed to understand why and if these different patterns hold true across other echinoderm blades, which is where some of our future work is gonna be uh, moving towards uh, with myself and Dr. Adrian Lamb and Brad Deline, who has been uh, on this work as well. 
So I'd like to take a moment to thank my funding sources, which have been very generous. Uh, my collaborators, primarily the museum curators and collections managers, who have been kind enough to uh, send photographs and specimens when possible and read my work, as well as the co-authors and co editors of the papers that we have been writing. So Adrian Lamb um, at Binghamton University, Nick Matsky in New Zealand, Brad DeLine at West Georgia University, Colin Sumrall at the University of Tennessee, and Jen Bauer at uh, the University of Michigan Museum of Paleontology. And with that, I will stop talking. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks, Colin. Um, and thank you, Sarah, for that really, really fun talk. Um, I, I, for one, love seeing all of the gorgeous pictures of the echinoderm fossils. I feel like I really appreciate getting to see those on things like this. Um, so just a reminder for those of you who have burning questions, I hope you have some. Um, we'd like you to send your questions to the questions at Paleo Park's host, who is Raymond today. She just left a message in the chat. And so you can just respond to that and leave your questions there. Um, to get us going, I actually had a question myself, which I have written down and will, will paste into the chat for us, um, asking about the... Um, dispersal patterns. And my, my question is, do you have a sense of how long the larval stage lasts in these groups? And oh, that, whether do you think the dispersal direction or length could be used to reconstruct things like the speed or the strength of ocean currents? Okay, so you are on my mind. This is a great question. Um, right now, of different forms. And we know this pretty much only from extant forms. So sea star larvae and sea urchin larvae are very different from one another, have different lifestyles and lengths of duration. In the fossil record, we really don't know. And there's a second mystery with this particular group in that we actually don't have juveniles of this group. Uh, Diplogorns have almost no juveniles in the fossil record whatsoever. They just show up as big honking things they don't have that small intermediary stage. So then it begs the question of, is their juvenile fossil record just really that bad? Or did they have like a prolonged larval stage? These have really tightly sutured bodies. So it's unlikely in my mind that they would have this, uh, you know, mysterious disappearance. If we've got the bigger ones, it would make sense. We'd at least find some smaller ones, but many of my undergraduates and myself have spent hours and hours and hours looking at sediment to see if we can even find disarticulated plates of juveniles and have found nothing. Thank you to my undergraduates. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, science. But uh, so at this point, we really don't know, but this is something I would like to look into in the future. Um, some have hypothesized that it's possible that Diplophorans had a longer uh, time as a larval stage, but we really don't know at this time. There's also been some evidence to show that some echinoderms have managed to lose or almost lose their larval stage. So it could be possible that we'd look at something like that as well. I really don't know. That's a great question. And I hope to have an answer for you someday. Do you have any thoughts? I'd love to hear them later. You know, I don't really. I um, just, my, my PhD is biological oceanography. So I think a lot about larval stages of all sorts of organisms and what they can do in the, in the marine ecosystem. And so I, I'm always curious about that, especially as you were talking a lot about dispersal. Um, so the next question I have is an anonymous question. It says, um, great talk. You showed that there was low dispersal during the Gobi. Um, are there other groups that also show this lower dispersal? Off the top of my head, I don't know. Um, so I think brachiopods and trilobite, these are, these are some of the first studies that have done a time sliced approach that looked at dispersal specifically within events. So it's hard for me to answer that question. Um, it would probably be a question that folks who spend the predominant amount of their research in the Gobi could probably answer this a little bit better than I could, but I don't think from the other things that we've seen, blastozoans probably aren't special in this particular part. So I imagine from what we've seen with um, trilobites and brachiopods kind of have similar dispersal patterns and things like that and speciation rates, I would guess it would be similar, but I really don't know the answer to that for sure. It's a great question. Thank you. Cool. Um. All right, and then we have another question it says, um, what do you think might be behind the increased body size that you observe in Laurentian fauna? 
I don't know. And this is what, I don't know. Um, this work is uh, pretty new. I was about to say it'll be published this week. So um, we're not entirely sure yet. So some of the ideas that we potentially have is it could have been increased nutrients in this particular area, but we're not entirely sure. So the refill systems in this area, so we're looking in Indiana about, which is mid-continental United States, which is a tropical paradise. Uh, no offense to anybody from Indiana listening now, back in the day. So sorry about the current situation with it being very cold. Um, but so there was a lot of nutrients in the area. So we also see an increase, I believe, in crinoid size as well during this time. So overall, I'm not entirely certain what could be causing it, but there seems to be at least some driver that is selecting for it, so, which is very intriguing. Excellent. Um, I was wondering about this a little bit as well. And my immediate thought was, was like nutrients, productivity, are we just seeing like larger bodies, but also maybe things like the larger body sizes of predators and prey make for larger body sizes or something. And that's another idea as well. So I mentioned that the Laurent or this uh, the Laurentian and Silurian organisms had a specialized type of respiratory structure um, called humatopores. I showed you briefly a picture, but no expectation that you'd remember it. They have the two pores that have a bunch of canals between them that are calcified. And those are actually buried beneath the surface of the, the plate. So you actually can't see them at all unless the fossil has been weathered. So it goes to stand that it's likely that there could have been some increased predation during this time because these uh, organisms have now finally buried their respiratory structures under the plate. It used to be that they were um, uh, right up on the surface with um, little pouchings of uh, uh, thin membranes, which would have been delicious for predators, of course. So could this have been you know, a response to predation as well? That is an idea and there is evidence to support it. Um, it could all higher water velocity that could have driven the respiratory structures to be kind of uh, under the surface because as you can imagine it's probably not that helpful to constantly have your thin membranes being bombarded by faster moving rains and things like that in the water column so there's a couple of alternative ide alternative ideas at this time that's a great question thank you i you know body size is wild and it all right. Um, so I have one more question right now. So if anyone else wants to get in your questions, now is a great time to do that. Um, but for now, the last question I have in our list here is thanks for your talk. Um, can geochemical records help to tell us about the dispersal of different species? Yes. So some of the work that we're going to be looking into, uh, especially uh, moving forward, is we're going to be uh, starting to look at the chemical signatures in different areas where we have a lot of these particular organisms to see if there might be some explanation as to or some correlation between these as to why they might be appearing in more areas. So I said that the Slurian uh, of Indiana was really unusual because all of a sudden we have thousands of these little critters. There's really only places in the world that show that ever. Another one is going to be in um, the Boda limestone of Sweden, where all of a sudden we just have a bazillion of them. Uh, scientifically speaking, of course, um, there's just littered with these diplogorans. And that's really it. These two areas, so we're going to start to look at some of the chemical signatures in those. And with broader testing, adding more and more species into this, I'm hoping that we should be able to better see uh, signatures kind of lining up those abiotic factors. I might be able to explain maybe some triggers that could have led to this. Excellent. All right, so we actually have a, a brave volunteer who'd like to ask a question verbally. So um, Brendan, we'll go ahead and let you unmute and ask your question. Yeah, I'm brave and not just unable to articulate something in text. Um, so hi, Brendan. Hi. My question is: when you see the kind of association of geographic distance and then disparity, do you see most of the disparity change along that like jump dispersal? And then they kind of go back to similar levels of changes in disparity per speciation event, or do they invade a new area and then have like increased change of disparity per speciation event? Like is each branch associated with more change in the new area or is most of the change associated immediately post jump? 
That's a great question. So I'm thinking it's closer to the former uh, of what you suggested. So we see most of that along that jump dispersal because once they actually get there, there's really not a whole lot of change. So we do see a little bit more change than, uh, for example, from the one, uh, we had one dispersal event from the Cincinnati Basin to uh, Southern Laurentia. So essentially Indiana to Quebec. Uh, so that was the largest amount of uh, morphological disparity change that we saw, which is also the largest biogeographic jump after they got into Laurentia. So after they moved to Laurentia. So we really see it happening along that pathway because once they get established, all of a sudden they really just don't do that much. Uh, they don't take off. They don't get any new um, wild hairs. They just kind of live in a state of weird stasis. So, which we was we were really surprised about. We expected to see something different. But could just if they all end up like looking similar, like you end up with all of the large ones or whatever, then I wonder if it's associated with the environmental conditions where they land or associated with whatever let them disperse, like some change to their larval state or something. Yeah, so that I don't know for sure just yet. So let's say so um, that would be something that would have to be looked at in future studies. Uh, but I'm excited to get into that for sure. It's hard. It's hard finding the baby fossils. <laughs> Thank you. It is a mission. Excellent. Um, so I think that that is all of the questions that we have for you today. If I am wrong. Um, somebody raise your hand real quick because I have a Zoom nightmare sitting down. Um, all right, so um, thank you, Sarah. I'm just going to go ahead and um, take out take our screen share so we can close out and just say um, thank you so much to Sarah for a really, really fun talk and some really spectacular fossil pictures as well. And um, we'd like to thank you all for joining us and um, ask you to, again, as a reminder, to please fill out our weekly survey if you can spare a moment. Um, and then we'd like to invite you back next week for something completely different when Mike McFerrin of the University of Colorado Boulder will give a talk on ice sheet modeling and dynamics. So we're going to go from the Paleozoic all the way up to the Pleistocene and maybe even some Holocene things as well. Um, so we'd love to see you next week. And Sarah, thank you again so very, very much for, for joining us for this week's seminar. Thank you so much for having me. Great.